Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. So today I'll be taking you through SAT Practice Test 3, the reading section. So I'll go through all five passages. I'll give you my tips, tricks, and advice for the reading section, as well as strategies and things like that. I'll also tell you why correct answer choices are correct and why some wrong answer choices are incorrect. So as I go through, I'll make sure that I'm giving you my best uh, effort to give you insight into the test, what I look for, and things like that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with passage one. Also, make sure to like, subscribe, and share. But with that, let's go ahead and get into passage one. All right, so questions one through 10 are based on the following passage. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna read through the passage in about three minutes, and then I'll get into the questions. All right, so this passage is adapted from Seiki, the schwartz Metterklume Method, originally published in 1911. Lady Carlota stepped out onto the platform of the small wayside station and took a turn or two up and down its uninteresting length to kill time till the train should be pleased to proceed on its way. Then in the roadway beyond, she saw a horse struggling with a more than ample load and a care carter of the sort that seems to bear a sullen hatred against the animal that helps him to earn a living. Lady Carlota promptly betook her onto the roadway and put rather a different complexion on the struggle. Certain of her acquaintances were wont to give her plentiful admonition as to the undesirability of interfering on behalf of a distressed animal, such interference being none of her business. Only once had she put the doctrine of non-interference into practice, when one of its most eloquent exponents had been besieged for nearly three hours in a small and extremely uncomfortable may tree by an angry boar pig. While Lady Carlota on the other side of the fence had proceeded with the watercolor sketch she was engaged on and refused to inter interfere between the boar and his prisoner. It is to be feared that she lost the friendship of the ultimately rescued lady. On this occasion, she merely lost the train which gave way to the first sign of impatience it had shown throughout the journey and steamed off without her. She bore the desertion with philosophical indifference. Her friends and rel relations were thoroughly well used to the fact of her luggage arriving without her. She wired a vague non-committal message to her destination to say that she was coming on by way of another train. Before she had time to think about what her next move might be, she was confronted by an imposingly attired lady who seemed to be taking a prolonged mental inventory of her clothes and looks. You must be Miss Hope, the governess I've come to meet, said the apparition, in a tone that admitted of very little argument. Very well, if I must, I must, said Lady Carlota to herself with dangerous meekness. I am Mrs. Quaborough, continued the lady, and where pray is your luggage? It's gone astray, said the alleged governess, falling in with the excellent rule of life that the absent are always to blame. The luggage had, in point of fact, behaved with perfect correctitude. I've just telegraphed about it, she added with a nearer approach to the truth. How provoking, said Mrs. Quaborough. These railway companies are so careless. However, my maid can lend you things for the night, and she led the way to her car. During the drive of the Quaborough mansion, Lady Carlota was impressively introduced to the nature of the charge that had been thrust upon her. She learned that Claude and Wilfred were delicate, sensitive young people, that Irene had the artistic temperament highly developed, and that Viola was something or else of a mold equally commonplace among children of that class and type in the 20th century. I wish them not only to be taught, said Mrs. Quaborough, but interested in what they learn. In the history lessons, for instance, you must try to make them feel as though they are being introduced to the life stories of men and women who really lived, not merely committing to memory a mass of names and dates to memory. French, of course, I shall expect you to talk at mealtime several days in the week. I shall talk French four days of the week in Russian and the remaining three. Russian, my dear Miss Hope, no one in the house speaks or understands Russian. That will not embarrass me in the least, said Lady Carlota coldly. Mrs. Quaborough, to use a colloquial expression, was knocked off her perch. She was one of those imperfectly self-assured individuals who are magnificent and autocratic as long as they are not seriously opposed. The least show of unexpected resistance goes a long way towards rendering them coward and apologetic. When the new governess failed to impress failed to express wondering admiration of the large, newly purchased and expensive car and lightly alluded to the superior advantages of one or two makes, which had just been put out on the market, the discomfiture of her patroness became almost abject. Her feelings were those which might have been animated a general of ancient warfaring days on beholding his heaviest battle elephant ignominiously driven off the field by slingers and javelin throwers. All right, now we can get into our questions. So we have which choice best summarizes the passage. Okay, this is really a big picture question asking us to summarize the passage as a whole. All right, so let's look at our options. We have A, a woman weighs the positive and negative aspects of accepting a new job. Well, we know that um, Mrs. Uh, Lady Carlota, we know Lady Carlota doesn't weigh the positive and negative aspects of accepting this new job. She actually impersonates Miss Hopes and just takes it. She just takes it. She doesn't weigh anything. Uh, a woman does not correct a stranger who mistakes her for being someone else. Yes, okay. Lady Carlota is believed by Mrs. Quaborough to be Miss Hope, right? Miss Quaborough is looking for Miss Hope. She finds Lady Carlota, and Lady Carlota does not correct her, and she just impersonates her, okay? So B is going to be our answer for summarizing this passage. C, a woman impersonates someone else to seek revenge. She's not seeking revenge, so that's why C is wrong. 
Uh, D, a woman takes an immediate dislike to her new employer. We never see any immediate dislike. Also, we don't know if she's ever eventually employed, okay, because she is impersonating Miss Hope. All right, part two, in line two, turn most nearly means. Well, this is a words and context question asking us to figure out what turn means in the context of the passage. So what we do with those is we go to line two, and then when we go to line two, we find turn, and we try to come up with our own answer choice for what that's going to mean. All right, so we have Lady Carlota stepped out onto the platform of a small wayside station and took a turn or two up and down its uninteresting length to kill time till the train should be pleased to proceed on its way. In this case, she's really taking like a stroll or a, a short walk, a leisurely stroll up and down this length of that train to try to kill that time. Okay, so I'm looking for an answer that says something like a leisurely stroll or a short walk. That's really what that turn means, okay? Uh, it's not a slight movement, not a change in rotation, it is a short walk. So C would be our answer there, and it's not a course correction either. All right, question three, the passage most clearly implies that other people regarded Lady Carlota as what? Well, this is really gonna probably be paired with an evidence question. I see it is down below. Uh, we know that other people are regarding Lady Carlota as outspoken. How do we know that? Well, they're not regarding her as tactful or ambitious, really, or unfriendly. In fact, she is very friendly. She even impersonates someone else. Uh, we, we also know that she goes out of her way to do things, right? And really, her going out of her way to do things is really why she's outspoken. Now, as far as evidence for that, that's where we talk about her doing things that are none of her business. Okay, so let's go ahead and find where that is. Right here. Okay, we see none of her business. So that's going to be where we want to close. Uh, we're probably going to want to open up at the beginning of that sentence, probably like right here. So we'd have certain of our acquaintances where we want to give her plentiful admonition as the undesirability of interfering on behalf of a distressed animal, such interference being none of her business. Okay, so that shows her being outspoken and outgoing, going out of her way to do things. Uh, we also know that her acquaintances know this, so we're sure that she talks about it, right? She's very outspoken in that way. So I'm looking at, at lines 10 to 14 is what I'd be looking at for my evidence there. So let's go ahead and see if we have that as an option. We see that we do, so that's A, okay? So we get three, we're gonna have A, and we got four, we're gonna have A. All right, question five. Let's see what question five has for us. Uh, as far as question types for question three, uh, so question four is just an evidence question. So identifying that question type, it's just gonna be about evidence. Uh, question three is really kind of a little detail question a little bit. Uh, also kind of talking about the characterization of Lady Carlota. Uh, that little detail that it talks about her being outspoken. All right, question five, the description of how Lady Carlota put the doctrine of non-interference into practice mainly serves to do what? Well, we know that when we talk about that, we really go on to tell this humorous story of her with the pig, right? And how she doesn't interfere with this lady who's stuck uh, by a tree with this pig for nearly three hours. So A, it's going to be humorous. So that's one thing I want to put down. Okay, and the story takes place right here with the angry boar pig. All right, so it's humorous. Uh, it's also showing an exception to what she normally does, right? It's only once that this happened. Um, so kind of using a humorous thing to develop Lady Carlota as a character is really what I'm looking at there. So let me see if I have something like that. I have A, foreshadow her capacity for deception. She didn't deceive anyone, so A is going to be incorrect. B, illustrate the subtle cruelty in her nature. Uh, no, we're not illustrating any cruelty. Her not interfering there isn't necessarily cruel. Um, also, it wouldn't necessarily be a full part of her nature because we also see she saves a donkey. Okay, or she saves a horse or whatever it was in the beginning. Okay, so we wouldn't necessarily say that she's cruel in nature. Uh, C, provide a humorous insight. Yes, it's providing a humorous insight into Lady Carlota, developing her as a character. So C is going to be our best answer for number five. As far as D, explain a surprising change in behavior. We don't actually explain why she does it. Okay, so D would be incorrect as well. All right, in line 55, charge most nearly means. That's also going to be a words in context question. So let's go ahead and let's go back to line 55. We'll find charge and then we'll come up with what it most nearly means. All right, we've got line 55. We have, during the drive to the Quabro mansion, Lady Carlota was impressively introduced to the nature of the charge that has been thrust upon her. All right, and then we know that we go on to talk about her being a nanny or a tutor. Okay, so that really is going to be talking about the job or the responsibilities is what I'd be looking at there. Okay, so that charge would most nearly mean job or responsibilities that she has to do. So we go down here, we see we don't have job, but we do have responsibilities. That would be our answer there. Uh, charge in this case does not mean fee. That would be if we're just using a synonym. It does not mean expense either or attack. Okay, We're just talking about her job or responsibility. All right, seven, the narrator indicates that Claude, Wilfred, Irene, and Viola are what? Well, we describe them as similar to their peers of the people in that class at that time. Okay. As far as evidence for that, I don't know if we're asked for evidence for the next one. I see we are not, but I'm going to go ahead and show you where it is anyway. Uh, it's right here. We talk about how Viola, we start at the end here, uh, Viola was something or other 
else of a mold equally commonplace among children of that class and type in the 20th century. Okay, so that's how I know that that's correct. We don't say they're more educated than kids their age or hostile to the governess or unusually creative and intelligent. All right, now we've got question eight. As far as what question seven was for question type, uh, that one's really just a little detail question, right? That was a small detail within the passage, so that's a little detail question. All right, question eight, the narrator implies that Ms. Quabrell favors a form of education that emphasizes what? This once again, focusing on a little detail of the passage, that's a little detail question. We know that she really prefers that, um, she really prefers that active engagement, right, of learning. She talks about how she wants the children to feel that things are real. Uh, she wants them to be speaking French, not just uh, learning facts, right, not factual retention. She actually says that explicitly. Uh, we don't really touch on artistic experimentation or traditional values. She really just wants them to be actively engaged, actively learning, viewing people as real people, not just facts and numbers. All right, question nine. As presented in the passage, Mrs. Quabro is best described as what? Uh, we don't describe her as superficially kind. All right, so we can get rid of A. Uh, B, outwardly imposing but easily defied. Yes, we do describe her as outwardly imposing and, or, and easily defied. And as far as where we describe that, uh, we're really describing that where we talk about her being, I'll go ahead and find it real quick, because I think I'm probably highlight, or I, I don't highlight on this, so let's go ahead and find where it was. All right, so we talk about her being easily defied, right? So that's right here, where we talk about how uh, the least show of unexpected resistance goes a long way towards running her coward and unapologetic. Uh, she was one of those imperfectly self-assured individuals who are magnificent and autocratic as long as they are not seriously opposed. So let's see if we have 77 to 82 as an option, because that would really show how she's autocratic, right? And she's really self-assured. But as soon as there's any resistance, she becomes apologetic. So let's see if we have that as an option. I see we do have 77 to 82 as an option. So that is going to be our best evidence for that, because it shows that she's outwardly imposing, but then she becomes apologetic once she is defied. Okay, so 9 will be B and 10 will be D. All right, so now let's go ahead and move on to passage 2. All right, let's get started with passage two. So questions 11 through 20 are based on the following passage and supplementary material. This passage is adopted from Terrace Gresco, Stephanger, or Straphanger, Saving Our Cities and Ourselves from the Automobile, copyright 2012 by Terrace Gresco. So I'll read through the passage and then we'll get into our questions and answers. Though there are 600 million cars on the planet and counting, there are also 7 billion people, which means that the vast majority of us are getting around involves taking buses, ferry boats, commuter trains, streetcars, and subways. In other words, traveling to work, school, or the market means being a strap hanger, somebody who by choice or necessity relies on public transport rather than a privately owned automobile. Half the population of New York, Toronto, and London do not own cars. Public transport is how most of the people of Asia and Africa, the world's most populous continents, travel. Every day, subway systems carry 155 million passengers, 34 times the number carried by all the world's airplanes, and the global public transport market is now valued at $428 billion annually. A century and a half after the invention of the internal combustion engine, private car ownership is still an anomaly. And yet, public transportation in many minds is the opposite of glamour. A squalid last resort for those with one too many impaired driving charges, too poor to afford insurance, or too decrepit to get behind the wheel of a car. In much of North America, they are right. Taking transit is a depressing experience. Anybody who has waited far too long on a street corner for the privilege of boarding a lurching, overcrowded bus or wrestled luggage onto the subways and shuttles to get to a big city airport knows that transit on this continent tends to be underfunded, ill-maintained, and ill-planned. Given the opportunity, who wouldn't drive? Hopping in a car almost always gets you to your destination more quickly. It doesn't have to be like this. Done right, public transportation can be faster, more comfortable, and cheaper than the private automobile. In Shanghai, German-made magnetic levitation trains skim over elevated tracks at 266 miles an hour, whisking people to the airport at a third of the speed of sound. In financial French towns, electric-powered streetcars run silently on rubber tires, sliding through the narrow streets along a single guide rail set into cobblestones. From Spain to Sweden, Wi-Fi-equipped high-speed trains seamlessly connect with highly ramified metro networks allowing commuters to work on laptops as they prepare for same-day meetings in once distant capital cities in latin america china and india working people board fast loading buses that move like subway trains along dedicated busways leaving the sedans and suvs of the rich mired in dawn to dusk traffic jams and some cities have transformed their streets into cycle path freeways making giant strides in public health and safety and sheer livability of their neighborhoods in the process, turning the workaday bicycle into a viable form of mass transit. If you credit the demographers, this transit trend has legs. The millennials who reached adulthood around the turn of the century and now outnumber baby boomers tend to favor cities over suburbs and are far more willing than their parents to ride buses and subways. Part of the reason is their ease 
with iPads, MP3 players, Kindles, and smartphones. You can get some serious texting done when you're driving, when you're not driving. And earbuds offer effective insulation from all but the most extreme commuting annoyances. Even though there are more teenagers in the country than ever, only 10 million have a driver's license versus 12 million a generation ago. Baby boomers may have been raised in Leave It to Beaver suburbs, but as they retire, a significant contingent is favoring older cities and compact towns where they have the option of walking and riding bikes. Seniors, too, are more likely to use transit, and by 2025, there will be 64 million Americans over the age of 65 already dwellings in older neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and Denver, especially those near light rail or subway stations, are commanding enormous price premiums over suburban homes. The experience of European and Asian cities shows that if you make buses, subways, and trains convenient, comfortable, fast, and safe, a surprisingly large percentage of citizens will opt to ride rather than drive. All right, let's go ahead and get into our questions now. So what function does the third paragraph, lines 20 to 34, serve in the passage as a whole? Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to that third paragraph and see what it says and then determine how that functions in the passage as a whole. So it was lines 20 to 34. I see we talk about how uh, public transport is the opposite of glamour. And then we go on to describe how it's really lacking, how it's underfunded, ill-maintained, and ill-planned in North America, particularly in America, and how using a car gets you to your destination more quickly. So really talking about the drawbacks of public transportation, which the author advocates here. So let's look at our answer choices. We have A, acknowledges a practice favored by the author, has some limitations. Yes, absolutely, that is correct. Okay, the practice favored by the author, which is public transport, right, it has limitations, okay? It's not glamorous, it's ill-maintained, it's underfunded, uh, ill-resourced, so it has limitations there. That's absolutely correct. As far as B, it illustrates with detail the arguments made in the first two paragraphs. We don't make an argument in the first two paragraphs. First two paragraphs, we just uh, provide context for the issue at hand. C, it gives an overview of a problem that has not been sufficiently addressed by the experts. No. Okay, we're not giving an overview of a problem there. We are discussing limitations, okay? And we're not saying that it hasn't been addressed by experts because we actually go on to talk about how uh, experts are addressing those problems by creating these high-speed rail lines, okay? So experts are addressing the problem. So C is incorrect. D advocates for abandoning a practice for which the passage as a whole mostly provides favorable data. We're not arguing for abandoning that practice. We actually argue for uh, for the pa for the practice of public transportation as a whole in this passage. So D is incorrect as well. All right, question 12. Which choice does the author explicitly cite as an advantage of automobile travel in America? She says that it's faster, and I'll go ahead and show you where that is as well. So she says it's faster right here, okay? Hopping in a car almost always get you to your destination more quickly. So that's gonna be from 32 to 34. So if my next question is evidence, which it might be, that's gonna be my evidence there. Uh, next question is, yep, it is evidence 32 to 34. Answer there is gonna be D. So 12C and then 13D. All right, question 14. The central idea of the fourth paragraph, which is lines 35 to 57, is what? Well, let's go come up with our own idea first so we're not swayed by answer choices. So we got 35 to 57. Let's see if we can find a central claim anywhere. So we see we have done right. Public transport can be faster, more comfortable, and cheaper than the private automobile. Then I see we really just go on to give evidence uh, to support that when public transportation is done right, it can be fast, it can be efficient, and it can be uh, quality as well, right? It can be uh, enjoyable. And we really just go on providing examples of that in different countries and different cities. Okay, so that's really going to be my main claim there, is that done right public transport can be better than a car. So let's see if we have that as an option. We have option A, European countries excel at public transportation. Uh, that's incorrect. That's not the central idea. Okay, we use European countries to support our central idea, but that isn't the central idea itself. So A is incorrect. B, some public transport systems are superior to travel by private automobile. Yes, indeed. That is exactly what we came up with on our own, and that is the correct answer. Okay, we argue how they can be faster. Uh, we, can, we argue how they can be more reliable. It looks like we have evidence for our next one, so I'll go ahead and find where that evidence was because I already found it, so I'll just find what lines it was again. Uh, we talk about it right here, so that's 35 to 37. Okay, we're talking about how done right public transport can be faster, more comfortable, and cheaper than the private automobile. So I'm going to see if that's an option for evidence, which I imagine it is, because that's the best possible evidence we could get there. And we see we do have that. We have that in answer choice B. <clears throat> All right. Uh, as far as why C and D are incorrect for 14, Americans should mimic foreign public transport systems when possible. We're not making that argument, okay? Also, we would have to specify which uh, which countries, okay? Not just all foreign, because certain ones are doing better. 
Uh, D, much international public transportation is engineered for passengers to work while on board. That's not the central idea. That's just something that is involved in evidence supporting our central idea. All right, question 16. As used in line 58, credit most nearly means what? Well, let's go to line 58 and come up with our own answer choice first. All right, line 58. We've got, if you credit the demographers, this transit trend has legs. Okay, so we're talking about the trend in transit here. Uh, we're talking about demographers, which are people who study populations. So we're really, in this scenario, credit here would really mean uh, if we're asking the demographers or if we are believing them in their claims. So ask or believe there would be good. Um, if you trust, okay, I would say if I was going to order these, I'd say b believe would be my number one choice. If we have that as an option, uh, I'd say um, ask would be my number two choice. Maybe trust would be three, but I think believe is definitely the strongest, most nearly means here. So let's see if we have that as an answer choice. I think believe is definitely the strongest. Um, and we see we do have that. So our answer there is going to be C. As far as uh, endow, we wouldn't say if you endow the demographers because we're not giving them anything, any award or anything. If you attribute the demographers, we're not attributing anything to them. We're just kind of uh, believing their believing their call here on what is going on as far as uh, transit trends. Okay, So we're really believing them. We're not honoring them with any award or honoring them in any term. We're just believing them and trusting them. Okay, So we ask them and we believe them and we trust their opinion. All right, question 17 is using line 61, favor most nearly means. So let's go to line 61, see what favor, uh, what the context around that is. So we have the millennials who reached adulthood around the turn of the century and now outnumber baby boomers tend to favor cities over suburbs. Another word we could use there would be tend to prefer cities over suburbs. So prefer is definitely going to be the answer there if that's an option. I have no doubt in my mind. Let's go ahead and find that. We see we do have that prefer. We wouldn't say that they indulge uh, a city over a suburb. We wouldn't say they resemble a city over a suburb or serve a city over a suburb. They simply prefer it over a suburb or favor it. All right, question 18. Which choice best supports the conclusion that public transport is compatible with the use of personal electronic devices? Well, that's going to be where we talk about uh, it getting rid of the annoyances. So one thing that I'd recommend for the SAT reading section is coming up with an answer choice, right? You should have a good idea of what you want to use as evidence. So in this case, I want to use the evidence where we talk about Kindles and iPods, because that's really when we're talking about those personal electronic devices. And I know we talk about that to get rid of those annoyances. So that's where I'm going to start looking, right, is lines 63 to 67, because that's probably where it's going to talk about those iPods and things, because they are used to get rid of those annoyances. So we have annoyances here, and I see I have iPads, MP3 players, Kindles. That's the evidence I'm going to want to use there because it talks about personal electronic device devices, getting rid of those annoyances. So that's line 63 to 67. Go find my answer there. I see that that's going to be answer choice B for 18. All right, question 19. Which choice is supported by the data in the first figure? All right, so in this situation, we're just going to take a quick glance at the first figure, see if we can come up with some data that we can just kind of recognize first. All right, so we have primary occupation of public transportation passengers in U.S. cities. So what's the primary occupation of that? All right, well, we have some employed outside the home. That's going to be my largest. I see second largest is student and third largest is retired. I see my smallest is the homemaker. All right, so we've got a general outline of what that says. Now we have option A, the number of students using the public transport system is greater than the number of retirees using public transportation. Yes, that's correct. All right, remember how I said students represented 10% and retirees were 6.7, so therefore students represent a greater proportion than do retirees. So answer choice A there is going to be correct. Right there, for a question like that, you really just have to go down A through D. In this case, A was correct, so we didn't even have to consider B, C, and D. Otherwise, we would just have to go down the line until we found an answer to choice that was correct. All right, question 20. Taken together, the two figures suggest the most people that most people who use public transportation what? All right, well, we see we have purpose of public transportation trips in U.S. cities, and we see most people are using public transportation to get to work, and we see that most people are employed outside the home who are using it. So we're going to look for a choice that has both of those components. So something that says people who are working outside of the home. All right, taken together, the two figures suggest that most people who use public transportation are A, employed outside the home, and take public transportation to work. Okay, that covers both of what we saw in figures one and two, so that right there is going to have to be our answer. Okay, we're not going to say B, C, or D, or even consider them because we already found that A was correct according to the figures, right? And that is going to be our correct answer. Nothing else then can be uh, correct according to the figures as far as people using public transportation because A has to be correct. All right, now we can move on to passage three. 
All right, let's get started with passage three. So questions 21 through 30 are based on the following passage. This passage is adopted from Thor Hansen. It's titled Feathers, copyright 2011 by Thor Hansen. Scientists have long debated how the ancestors of birds evolved the ability to fly. The ground up theory assumes they were fleet footed ground dwellers that captured prey by leaping and flapping their upper limbs. The tree down theory assumes they were tree climbers that leapt and glided among branches. At field sites around the world, Ken Dial saw a pattern in how young pheasants qual Tynemius and other ground birds ran along their parents. They jumped like, up like popcorn, he said, describing how they would flap their half-formed wings and take short hops into the air. So when a group of graduate students challenged him to come up with new data on the age-old ground-up tree-down debate, he designed a project to see what clues might lie and how baby game birds learn to fly. Ken settled on the Chukar patridge as a model species, but he might not have made his discovery without a key piece of advice from the local rancher in Montana who was supplying him with birds. When the cowboy stopped by to see how things were going, Ken showed him his nice, tidy laboratory setup and explained how the bird's first hops and flights would be measured. The rancher was incredulous. He took one look and said, in pretty colorful language, what are those birds doing on the ground? They hate to be on the ground. Give them something to climb on. At first, it seemed unnatural. Ground birds don't like the ground. But as he thought about it, Ken realized that all the species he'd watched in the wild preferred to rest on ledges, low branches, or other elevated perches where they were safe from predators. They really only used the ground for feeding and traveling, so he brought in some hay bales from the Chukars to perch on, and then left his son in charge of feeding and data collection while he went away on a short work trip. Barely a teenager at the time, young Terry Dial was visibly upset when his father got back. I asked him how it went, Ken recalled, and he said, Terrible. The, bir the birds are cheating. Instead of flying up to their perches, the baby Chukars were using their legs. Time and time again, Terry had watched them run right up so to the side of the hay bale, flapping all the while, Ken dashed out to see for himself, and that was the aha moment. The birds were using their wings and legs cooperatively. He told me in that this single observation opened up a world of possibilities. Working together with Terry, who has since gone on to study animal locomotion, Ken came up with a series of ingenious experiments, filming the birds as they raced up textured ramps tilted at increasing angles. As the incline increased, the patridges began to flap, but they angled their wings differently from birds in flight. They aimed their flapping down and backward, using the force not for lift, but to keep their feet firmly pressed against the ramp. That's like the spoiler on the back of a race car, he explained, which is a very apt analogy. In Formula One racing, spoilers are big aerodynamic fins that push the cars downward as they speed along, increasing traction and handling. The birds were doing the very same thing with their wings to help them scramble up otherwise impossible slopes. Ken called the technique war for wing-assisted incline running, and went on to document it in a wide range of species. It not only allowed young birds to climb vertical surfaces within the first few weeks of life, but also gave adults an energy-efficient alternative to flying. In the Chukar experiments, adults regularly used war to ascend ramps steeper than 90 degrees, essentially running up the wall and onto the ceiling. In an evolutionary context, war takes on surprising explanatory powers. With one fell swoop, the dials came up with a viable origin for the flapping flight stroke of birds, something gliding animals don't do unless a shortcoming of the tree down theory and an aerodynamic function for half-formed wings, one of the main drawbacks to the ground up hypothesis. All right, so now let's get into the questions. So we got which choice best reflects the overall structure uh, or the overall sequence of events in the passage. All right, well, we wanna come up with our own answer choice first. So let's go ahead and take a look at the passage and see what uh, kind of occurs in sequence here. So we start out with this uh, challenge to formulate this, um, to gather this new data on the earth versus, uh, on this ground versus tree theory, basically, right? The tree down theory versus the ground up hypothesis. Uh, that leads him to formulate his own experiment using these birds. That experiment then he decides to adapt based on information from the rancher um, after he only gets into very, very early stages of it. And that causes him to create these new experiments in which he takes the results from that experiment and applies it to that evolutionary uh, theory. Okay, so we're gonna look for an answer choice that has that. So we have A, an experiment is proposed but proves unworkable. It never proved unworkable, so A is incorrect. B, a new discovery leads to reconsideration of a theory. That's not what we start with, so that's not the sequence of events. That's what we kind of end with. C, an anomaly is observed and it simulated experimentally. There's no anomaly observed. Um, also, the results aren't really compared with previous findings and the hypothesis isn't novel. Okay, so we can get rid of C for sure. D, an unexpected finding arises during the early phases of a study. Yes, that unexpected finding is that they prefer to stay on those ledges, right? And that they aren't um, they aren't hopping on them. They're kind of pushing down with their wings to move uh, kind of like climbing on the side of a wall and then onto the ceiling, it says. Um, and then we have the studies modified in response to that finding, which it is. We now transition to them climbing up steep angles. And then those results are interpreted and evaluated uh, for that evolutionary perspective. So D is our answer for 21. 22, as used in line 7, challenge most nearly means. 
Well, we can go ahead and go to line seven and come up with our own answer choice for what challenge must most nearly mean. That way we're not swayed by the answer choices or stuck between two. All right, so, so when a group of graduate students challenged him to come up with new data on the age old ground up tree down debate, he designed the project to see what clues might lie and how baby game birds learn to fly. Okay, in this case, these graduate students are challenging him or daring him, right? So they dared him to come up with a new data on this uh, age, age old ground up tree down debate, okay? So they're not just asking him to, but they're really challenging him or daring him to. Like, hey, this is an interesting debate. Can you come up with something on this? We really dare you to, because we think that'd be cool. They're challenging him and they're daring him to do that. So let's see if dare is an answer choice, and it is, okay? They're not requiring him to do it. They aren't saying you have to. They're simply challenging or daring him to. They're not disputing with him, and they're also not competing with him. They're not running a simultaneous experiment to go against his. So neither B, C, or D would be correct there. Which statement best captured Ken Dial's central assumption in setting up his research? Well, that central assumption, we know that that's the acquisition of flight in young birds, shedding light on the acquisition of flight in their evolutionary ancestors, right? And if we wanted to go back, I can go ahead and show you how I know that that's my answer, All right? That's going to be right here, okay? When we talk about him being challenged to come up with new data for this ground up versus tree down debate, that age old question, he designs his project, right? That initial assumption that he's making that his experiment lies on is that there's going to be clues in how baby game birds learn to fly that will apply to this age old question. Okay, so if there's an evidence question after that, that'd be 6 to 11. Uh, and there is an evidence question after that, so that's going to be B, 6 through 11. Right, that's not talking about any tendency of certain young birds to jump erratically. Okay, we never talk about that. C, young birds in a controlled research setting are less likely than birds in the wild. We don't compare them to those in the wild versus those in a research setting. D, ground dwelling and tree climbing predecessors to birds evolved in parallel. We don't make that assumption either, or at least that assumption isn't driving our research. All right, 25, in the second paragraph, lines 12 to 32, the incident involving the local rancher mainly serves to what? Well, we know that when we talk about that, that uh, local rancher, what that does is that changes what our experiment's going to end up being, right? Because now we place these hay bales in there, and that really changes our experimental setup and ultimately what our results are and how we apply that to that evolutionary theory, right? So if we go and we take a look at those lines, which we'll go ahead and do real quick, uh, we see that we talk about how it causes us to now put things that they can climb on, right? Give them something to climb on. We put in those hay bales, uh, and then we start taking data with this new experimental design. All right, so now let's just go ahead and run it back down here to 25. So as far as which answer choice is going to be correct, let's look at our options. We have A, reveal Ken Dial's motivation for undertaking this project. No, we're not revealing his motivation. Underscore certain differences between field research and laboratory research. We're not doing that either because we don't discuss the difference between the two. Uh, C, show how an unanticipated piece of information influenced Ken Dial's research. Yes, right. We're talking about how this rancher's perspective is influencing his research because it caused him to remember how um, in the wild they like to be on uh, branches and such. Okay, it's not introducing any key contributor to the tree down theory either. So C is our answer for 25. 26, after Ken Dial had his aha moment, what did he do? Well, let's go figure out what he did after that aha moment. Okay, it said it was line 41. We see we have his aha moment. Uh, the birds were using their wings and legs cooperatively, uh, and this opened up a world of possibilities. After that, he came up with ingenious experiments where he filmed them racing up textured uh, ramps at increasing angles. Okay, so we're looking at increasing angles and textured ramps as our follow-up experiment to that aha moment. So we have A, tried to train birds to fly to their perches. He doesn't try to train them. B, studied videos to determine why the birds no longer hop. That's not the videos that he studied. He studied them going up steeper inclines. Uh, C, observed how birds dealt with gradually steeper inclines. Yes, that's what our evidence said, and that's what the passage says. We're not consulting other researchers who studied those same species either. So D is incorrect there. All right, 27. The passage identifies which of the following is a factor that facilitated their traction on steep ramps. That's going to be that downward force that he compared to the spoiler of a car, okay? And how did they get that downward force? Well, not the speed with which they climbed. They got it by the position of their flapping wings, okay? So that position of their flapping wings created that downward force that gave them that traction. All right, it's not the alternation of wing and foot movement because we know that, that was cooperative. Uh, and their continual hopping motions is also incorrect because we know it was the flapping motion of their wings. All right, now we got question 28 in line 61, document most nearly means what? Well, let's go to line 61 and let's come up with our own answer choice first. All right, so we got line 61, document. Ken called the technique war for wing-assisted incline running and went on to document it, so document it in a wide range of species. Okay, in this case, document would mean something like record, record or observe would be the two best there. 
because he's documenting it in the wide range of species, he's observing it in a wide range of species, or he's recording it in a wide range of species. So observer records really what I'm looking for in there. I see in line 61, document most nearly means we don't have observed, but we do have record. So record there will be our answer. Okay, we're not portraying anything, uh, we're not publishing anything, um, or processing anything. We're really just recording or documenting that difference. All right, question 29. What can be reasonably inferred about gliding animals from the passage? Well, we know we talk about gliding animals at the end, and we say that they don't use this flight flapping stroke. Okay, we have with one fell swoop, the dials came up with a viable origin for the flight flapping stroke uh, of birds, something gliding animals don't do, and thus a shortcoming. Uh, my screen isn't working. I can't tell if it's doing that on yours as well, but we see that we have here uh, a viable origin for the flapping flight stroke of birds, something gliding animals don't do. So gliding animals don't use that flight flapping stroke. Okay, so that's going to be what they don't do. All right, and that's an inference we can make because it says it, right? It has evidence to support it. Uh, I can't tell if this my screen's messing up right now. I don't know if it's doing that on yours as well. If it is, I'm sorry about that. Um, let's look at our answer choice. So we have A, their young tend to hop along beside them. That's not what it's saying. B, their method of locomotion is similar to that ground birds. It's saying it's not similar. C, they use the ground for feeding more than perching. We're not making that inference. Uh, but D, we have they do not use a flapping stroke to aid in climbing slopes. Yes, that's supported by the text that they don't use that flapping stroke. And that was in lines 72 to 74. Okay, we could go back up and I can show you that was lines 72 to 74 because I just talked about it. Okay, right here. We got 72. Uh, something gliding animals don't do down to 74 right here. So 72 to 74. All right, so that's going to be 72 to 74, which is answer choice D. All right, now let's go ahead and move on to passage four. All right, let's get started with passage four. So that's going to be questions 31 to 41. We've got two passages. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read through passage one, answer the questions on passage one. And then I'll go back and read through passage two, answer the questions on passage two. Then after that, I'm going to answer the questions that ask for us to relate both of them together. Okay, so that's the strategy that I would use if I were doing the reading section, and that's the strategy I would recommend that you use. And here's why. If we read passage one and answer the questions about it first, we're not going to mix it up with passage two because the arguments and the topic are going to be similar. Okay, the topic will always be similar on two passage sections like this. So we want to read one passage first so we don't mix it up with the second one. After we answer the questions about the first one, we go read the second one, answer the questions about the second one, then we relate them together. That way we don't mix them up as much. Okay, So that's the best way to do it. That's how I recommend you do it. That's how I'm going to do it here. So let's go ahead and read passage one. It's adopted from Taylor Rand at L. It's called The Report on Public Instruction, and it was originally published in 1791. All right, one thing else that I also recommend doing is reading the full part here. So we got Passage 2 is adopted from Mary Wollstonecraft, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, originally published in 1792. Tally Rand was a French diplomat. The report was a plan for national education. Wollstonecraft, a British novelist and political writer, wrote Vindication in response to Tally Rand. All right, so I know my second one, uh, my second passage is in response to my first passage. So that's just something I can keep in mind as I read my first passage. With that, we get into our first passage, which is written by Tally Rand. That half of the human race is excluded by the other half from any participation in government, that they are native by birth but foreign by law in the very land where they were born, and that they are property owners yet have no direct influence or representation, are all political phenomena apparently impossible to explain on abstract principle. But on another level of ideas, the question changes and may be easily resolved. The purpose of all these institutions must be the happiness of the greatest number. Everything that leads us farther from this purpose is an error. Everything that brings us closer is truth. If the exclusion from public employments decreed against women leads us to a greater sum of mutual happiness for the two sexes, then this becomes a law that all societies have been compelled to acknowledge and sanction. Any other ambition would be a reversal of our primary destinies, and it will never be in women's interest to change the assignment they have received. It seems to us incontestable that our common happiness, above all of that of women, requires that they never aspire to the exercise of political rights and functions. Here we must seek their interests in the wishes of nature. It is not apparent that their delicate constitutions, their peaceful inclinations, and the many duties of motherhood set them apart from strenuous habits and onerous duties and summon them to gentle occupations and the cares of the home. And is is it not evident that the great conserving principles of societies, which makes the division of powers a source of harmony, has been expressed and revealed by nature itself when it divided the functions of the two sexes in so obviously distinct a manner? This is sufficient. We need not invoke principles that are inapplicable to the question. Let us not make rivals of life's companions. You must, you truly must allow the persistence of a union that no interest, no rivalry can possibly undo. Understand that the good of all depends this of you, or demands this of you. All right, let's go ahead and get into our questions for passage one then, because we see passage two starts next. 
All right, so we have as used in line 21, common most nearly means. I see most nearly means. I know this is a words and context question, so I'm going to go to line 21, and I'm going to come up with my own answer for what common means. That way I'm not stuck between two. So I've got, it seems to us incontestable that our common happiness above that of all that of women requires that they never expire to exercise political rights and functions. So this here, this common happiness is referring to that common happiness between man and woman, which could also be referred to as that shared happiness between man and woman. So I'm going to see if we have shared as an answer choice, because that would be the most fitting, uh, most nearly means answer. And I see I do have shared, so that would be my answer there. So 31 should be B. Uh, it's not the average happiness, it's that shared happiness that they share together with each other. Not coarse, not similar. All right, B, or 32. Uh, it can be inferred that the authors of passage one believe that running a household and raising children, what? Well, I can go ahead and show you where we talk about that in passage one. Uh, we talk about how, let's see where we got it at. Passage one, uh, right here, where is that at? Oh, uh, we got it right, right here. Their peaceful inclinations, meant, okay, right here. All right, the peaceful many duties of motherhood, peaceful inclinations, set them apart from strenuous habits and onerous duties and summon them to gentle occupations and the cares of the home. Okay, so this is really talking about how what women do in the home, the duties of motherhood, it takes them away from these strenuous habits or this difficult work and things that are uh, straining. Okay, so it takes them away from difficult tasks that are physically demanding. So let's see if we have an answer choice that says that. A says, are rewarding for men as well as women. We don't make that argument. B, yield less value for society than do the roles performed by men. We don't talk about value for, for society between men and women and their roles. C, until very few activities that are difficult or unpleasant. Yes, we do make that argument that there are very few that are difficult or physically demanding or unpleasant. So C, we do make that argument in passage one. D, requires skills similar needed to run the country or a business. We do not make that argument. All right, as far as evidence for that, we already found our evidence for that. When I went and explained it, we see that that's from about 20, uh, 25 here to just about 30. So I'm gonna look for evidence that says 25 to 30, right? I already explained why that's our evidence when I talked about why C was correct. So I see 33, answer there is gonna be C lines 25 to 30. All right, now we've got question 34. It says, according to the author of passage two, at this point, I go ahead and I read passage two. So I'll go ahead and do that, switch over to passage two. I know it's by Wollstonecraft, because I remember from when I read in the beginning, but I'll quick revisit that, refresh your memory. Wollstonecraft is a British novelist and political writer. She wrote Vindication in response to that author of passage one. So this is in response to passage one uh, that Wollstonecraft is writing this. So we got contending for the rights of woman. My main argument is built on this simple principle that if she not be not prepared by education to become the companion of man, she will stop the progress of knowledge and virtue for truth must be common to all or it will be inefficacious with respect to its influence on general practice and how can women be expected to cooperate unless she know why she ought to be virtuous unless freedom strengthen her reason till she comprehend her duty and see in what manner it is connected with her real good if children are to be educated to understand the true principle of patriotism their mother must be a patriot and the love of mankind from which an orderly train of virtues spring can only be produced by considering the moral and civil interest of mankind but the education and situation of woman at present shuts her out from such investigations consider sir dispassionately these observations for a glimpse of this truth seemed to open before you before you when you observed that to see one half of the human race excluded by the other from all participation of government was a political phenomenon that according to abstract principles, it was impossible to explain. If so, on what does your constitution rest? If the abstract rights of man will bear discussion and explanation, those of woman by, by parity of reasoning will not shrink from the same test. Though a different opinion prevails in this country built on the very arguments which you used to justify the oppression of woman, prescription, consider I address you as a legislator, whether when men contend for their freedom and to be allowed to judge for themselves respecting their own happiness, it be not inconsistent and unjust to subjugate women, even though you firmly believe that you are acting in the manner best calculated to promote their happiness. Who made man the exclusive judge, if women partake with him the gift of reason? In this style are you tyrants of every denomination, from the weak king to the weak father of the family. They are all eager to crush reason, yet always assert that they usurp its throne only to be useful. Do you not act a similar part when you force all women by denying them civil and political rights to remain immured in their families groping in the dark? All right, now we can go ahead and get to question 34. So according to the author of passage two, in order for society pr to progress, women must do what? All right, well, we aren't arguing that they need to enjoy personal happiness and financial security, so we can get rid of that. Uh, what we do talk about, though, is in the beginning of our passage, we talk about education, right? How women need to have that same education as men, right? The education and situation of women at present 
uh, keeps her out of such investigations because she's not receiving that same education, right? If children are to be educated and to understand the true principle of patriotism, their mother must be a tr patriot, which means their mother must be educated as well. Okay, so we're arguing for education for women. So we've got receive an education comparable to that of men. That's going to be answer choice D. C, replace men as figures of power and authority. We don't make that argument. We also don't argue that we should uh, follow all currently prescribed social rules. In fact, we're arguing for increased political roles and social roles for women. So that would be incorrect as well. So 34, our answer there is going to be D. All right, 35. 35, give me one minute. We got 35. All right, as used in line 50, most reason most nearly means, this could be a words and context question. So let's go ahead and go to line 50. Come up with our own answer choice first. So we got line 50, word is reason. All right, so we have unless freedom strengthen her reason till she comprehend her duty and see in what manner it is connected with her real good. So keep in mind, we were talking about uh, education here. We're talking about how she wants freedom to strengthen her own reason or her own intelligence, ability to think for herself, or her intellect, right? Really talking about her ability to think for herself and to uh, formulate concepts and ideas and uh, put those into writing, right? So increasing her ability to think for herself, giving her that freedom to think uh, through education. So we're talking about her reason here. That's meaning really her intellect. All right, that intellect which would allow her to comprehend her duty as well. Okay, so we see we do have intellect, right? We're not arguing for reason in the sense of it being her motive or her sanity. We aren't arguing whether she's sane or not or an explanation. We're arguing for her gaining that reason, that knowledge, right? That knowledge, that intellect, right? To be able to make those thoughts on her own and be able to publish those thoughts. So she needs education to do that. So C is gonna be our answer for 35. All right, question 36. We got in passage to the author's claims that freedom granted by society's leaders have done what? Well, she's really arguing that society's leaders have only given privileges uh, to men, not as many to women, right? She says that it is, uh, and it looks like our next question is evidence as well. So we can go ahead and find that as well. So we can actually go back up and I'll find you where it says that, right? She talks about uh, men contending for their freedom, right? She talks about men being able to be judges uh, for their own happiness. We talk about subjugating women, right? The people in power, which are men, are subjugating women. Uh, and even though they believe they're acting in a manner to promote their happiness, they're really not, right? Who made man the exclusive judge? So we're really kind of looking at this 73 here. Uh, down to this about 78 is really what we're looking at. This subjugate woman should be in there. So we want to include 76 for sure. So let's look for an answer choice that has all of that. And I see I have 72 to 78, which is perfect. We'll go ahead and take that. That's going to be our answer there. So 37, our answer there is going to have to be D. Uh, we're not talking about in passage to the author claiming freedoms granted by society's leaders have what? Uh, we're not talking about re resulting in a reduction in individual virtue. We never say that. We're not, definitely not saying that it's caused equality for all people because we know women didn't have equality. And we're not saying it's caused arguments about the nature of happiness either. All right, so 37, that's an evidence question, obviously, because we're just providing evidence. Uh, as far as question types, I forgot to do a couple. Words and context is what 35 will be. I think I said that. Uh, did I get 34 as well? Let's just quick check. Um, yeah, 33 is an evidence question. 32 is an inference question. Uh, 31 is a words and context question. 34 is a, according to the author of Passage 2, in order for society to progress, women must. Um, that one's really a big picture question, 34. Big picture, a little bit of a little detail in education, but more of a big picture question. So I just wanted to go through and give you guys some question types there, because I know I said I would in the beginning of the video, and just wanted to quick do that, because I kind of forgot a little bit. All right, now we got question 38. So in lines 61 to 65, the author of Passage 2 refers to a statement made in Passage 1 in order to do what? Well, let's go line 61 to 65, come up with our own answer choice first. All right, so we see we have consider sir dispassionately these observations for a glimpse of this truth seem to open before you uh, when you observed that to see one half of the human race excluded by the other form of all participation of government was a political phenomenon that according to abstract principles, it was impossible to explain. If so, right, so if it's impossible to explain, on what does your constitution rest? What makes it impossible to explain? Well, what you're arguing makes it impossible to explain is the abstract rights of man, right? But you have to consider those rights of woman is what she's saying, right? By parity of reasoning, we can't think about only the rights of man. We have to think about the rights of women as well, which they're not considering. So she's really breaking down their argument in order to build hers. Okay, so she's developing her argument by breaking down theirs. So I'm going to look for an answer choice that has that. We have A, call into question the qualifications of the author's passage one. We're not calling into question their qualifications. 
uh, disputing an assertion made about women in the first sentence of passage one. Well, in the first sentence of passage one, we talk about women uh, not having the same rights as man, which we're not disputing that. We're agreeing with that right now, that they don't have those at this time. C, developing her argument, yes, by highlighting what she sees as flawed reasoning in passage one. Yes, she's hitting that argument in passage one to develop her argument. So C is going to be our best answer for 38. Uh, D, validating the concluding declarations made by the author about gender roles. No, she disagrees with those concluding declarations that the author of passage one made. All right, now we got question 39. Which best describes the overall relationship between passage one and passage two? That's a big picture question because we're talking about the overall relationship. Uh, we know passage two is strongly challenging that point of view in passage one. Passage one, the strong point of view in passage one is that uh, nature has given man and women different biological roles, which has thus given them different social and political roles. Passage two is saying, no, that is incorrect. Uh, political roles are different from biological roles. Biology should not influence political roles. So passage two is strongly disagreeing. Passage two is not drawing an alternative conclusion from evidence presented in passage one, because passage one is presenting uh, no evidence that passage two is really using or drawing conclusions from. Pa uh, C, passage two is elaborating on a proposal from passage one. Passage one presents no proposal, so that's wrong. Passage 2 is restating in different terms the argument presented in passage 1. No, we are disagreeing with argument 1 passage, or I'm sorry, the argument in passage 1, so we're not restating that in different terms. We are disagreeing with it. 40, the authors of both passages would most likely agree with which of the following statements about women in the 18th century. So this one's kind of an inference question, but you're going to use textual evidence to support it. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to have evidence as our next question because we don't, but you could use evidence to support your answer, okay? In both passages, both women would agree with D, that they generally enjoyed fewer rights than men did, right? We know in passage one, we start off by saying women have less rights than men, and in passage two, that's really our whole theme in that passage, is that women have less rights than men and they need more, okay? We don't argue that they're just as happy in life as men are, so C is wrong. We don't argue that, uh, or I'm sorry, passage one doesn't argue that they need a good education to be successful in society. Passage 2 does, but Passage 1 does not. We need for both of them to. Uh, their natural prefer preferences were the same as those of men. Passage 1 says that. Passage 2 does not. All right, question 41. How would the authors of Passage 1 most likely respond to the points made in the final paragraph of Passage 2? This is once again an inference question. I just dropped my pen. All right, so how would the authors of Passage 1 most likely respond to those points? Well, let's go ahead and figure out what those points are at that final paragraph in Passage 2 real quick. Uh, we see that those points are that uh, we've got uh, her arguing that uh, men are denying women civil and political rights and forcing them to stay in the home in the dark with their families. Um, he's basically saying that that's wrong, right? So the author of Passage 1 is really going to disagree with that by saying that uh, the different sexes, right, the different biological components of men and women are really making women not suited for the exercise of civil and political rights. So 41 there, A is gonna be our best answer choice there. She's really saying women aren't naturally suited for the exercise of civil and political rights. Key part there being naturally, right? Because she bases her argument on biology. All right, uh, B, men and women possessing similar degrees of reasoning ability. We don't touch on that. C, women don't need to be combined in traditional family duties. Passage one actually thinks that they should, so that's wrong as well. Uh, D, the principles of natural law should not be invoked when considering general roles or gender roles. Uh, author of passage one actually very very much believes in nature and uh, nature's influence on gender rules so that would be incorrect as well all right so that takes us through all of uh, that passage right there so now we've got one passage left that's gonna be passage five i'm just checking to make sure we answered all those and we did now we go ahead and we move on to passage five here so this is our last passage all right let's get started with the fifth passage so questions 42 to 52 are based on the following passage and supplementary material this passage is adopted from Richard J. Sharp and Liza Hayden. Honey bee colony collapse disorder is possibly caused by a dietary pyrethrium deficiency. Copyright 2009 by Elsevier LTD. Colony collapse disorder is characterized by the disappearance of adult worker bees from hives. Honey bees are hosts to the pathogenic large ectoparasite mite Vero destructor, Vero mites. These mites feed on bee hemolymph blood and can kill bees directly or by increasing their susceptibility to secondary infection with fungi, bacteria, or viruses. Little is known about the natural defenses that keep that mite, the mite infections under control. Pyrethriums are a group of flowering plants which include Chrysanthium coccinium, Chrysanthium cinerifolium, Chrysanthium marshalli, and related species. These plants produce potent insecticides with anti-mite activity. The naturally occurring insecticides are known as pyrethriums. A synonym for the naturally occurring pyrethriums is pyrethrin, and synthetic analogous of pyrethriums are known as pyrethroids. 
In fact, the human mite infestation is known as scabies. Is treated with a topical pyrethrium cream. We suspect that the bees of commercial bee colonies which are fed monocrops are nutritionally deficient. In particular, we postulate that the problem is a diet deficient in antimite toxins, pyrethriums, and possibly other nutrients which are inherent in such plants. Without at least intermittent feeding on the pyrethrium producing plants, bee colonies are susceptible to mite infestations which can become fatal either directly or due to a secondary infection of immunocompromised or nutritionally deficient bees. The secondary infection can be viral, bacterial, or fungal and may be due to one or more pathogens. In addition, immunocompromised or nutritionally deficient bees may be further weakened when commercially produced insecticides are introduced into their hives by beekeepers in an effort to fight mite infestation. infestation. We further postulate that the proper dosage necessary to prevent mite infestation may be better left to the bees who may seek out or avoid pyrethrium containing plants depending on the amount necessary to defend against mites and the amount already consumed by the bees, which in higher doses could be potentially toxic to them. This hypothesis can be tested by a trial wherein a small number of commercial honey bee colonies are offered a number of pyrethrium producing plants as well as a typical bee food source such as clover, which controls are offered only the clover. Mites could be then introduced to each hive with note made as to the choice of the bees and the effects of the mite parasites on the experimental colonies versus control colonies. It might be beneficial to test wild type honeybee colonies in this manner as well in case there should be any genetic difference between them that affects the bees preferences for pyrethrium producing flowers. Okay, and then we have a table pathogen occurrence in honeybee colonies with and without colony collapse disorder. All right, now let's get into our questions. So we got 42. How do the words can, may, and could in the third paragraph lines 19 through 41 help establish the tone of the paragraph. All right, well, what they're really doing in that paragraph, if we go there, the words were can, uh, can, may, I think the other one was could, um, but we see which can become fatal either directly or due to a secondary uh, infection. We suspect that the bees of uh, that the bees of commercial bee colonies, which are fed monocrops are nutritionally uh, deficient. We're postulating. Um, we see we had can, we had may, um, Really, the use of the words such as postulate, can, may, um, might, things like that, all of those are really serving to show that they aren't sure yet, right? They think and they have their hypothesis, but they're not totally, uh, they're not totally sure. These words like could, may, can, they're showing that they're not totally sure and they're establishing that tone that they don't know for sure, but they suspect uh, that their claims are correct. So we have option A, they create an optimistic tone that makes clear the authors are hopeful about the effects of their research on colony collapse disorder. Uh, no, it's not creating a tone of optimism, and it's not making it clear that the authors are hopeful about the effects of their research. Okay, what about B? They're creating a dubious tone. No, they're not creating a dubious tone, and it doesn't make clear that the authors don't have confidence in the usefulness of the research described. Them postulating and suspecting um, and being fairly confident in their hypothesis, um, that's not showing that they don't have confidence in their usefulness. That's showing that they do have confidence in it. Uh, C, they create a tentative tone. Yes, it is creating a tentative tone. Um, that makes clear the authors suspect but do not know that their hypothesis is correct. Yes, they're postulating and they're suspecting that they're correct with their hypothesis, but the words such as can, may, and could are showing that they don't know for sure whether or not it's correct yet. So C is our best answer for 42. D, they create a critical tone that makes clear the authors are skeptical of claims that pyrethriums are inherent in monocrops. That is not really our main focus. We're not really uh, focused on the inherent um, pyrethriums and monocrops. It's also not creating a critical tone, so that's why D is incorrect as well. All right, 43. In line 42, authors state that a certain hypothesis can be tested by a trial based on the passage which the following is a hypothesis the authors suggest be tested in a trial. Well, really what they're talking about in line 42 when they say it can be tested by a trial is the trial being those pyrethriums, right, and whether those pyrethriums uh, can help fight off those mite infections, right? So it's about whether pyrethrium producing plants are able to help fight off those mites. So let's see if we have an option that really touches on that. So let's go ahead and roll through our options A through D. So we've got uh, A, honeybees that are exposed to both pyrethriums and mites are likely to develop a secondary infection. That's not what they want to test in the trial. They're not suggesting they test uh, whether or not they're more likely to develop secondary infections. So A is wrong. B, beekeepers who feed on who feed their bee colonies a diet of single crop need to increase the use of insecticides. Okay, us saying that they need to increase the use of insecticides to prevent mite infestations, that's not something that can be tested. That's just us making a claim. So B is definitely wrong. C, a honeybee diet that includes pyrethriums results in honeybee colonies that are more resistant to mite infestations. Yes, that can be tested. That's something that, uh, that's a claim that we say should be tested, right? Whereas with B, 
we never make the claim that um, a diet of single crop needs to increase um, their use of insecticides to prevent mite infestations. We don't suggest that. In fact, we suggest that insecticides can actually be harming bees further. Okay, so that would be wrong for sure. Uh, C, a honeybee diet that includes pyrethrums result in honeybee colonies that are more resistant to mite infestations. Yes, we say that uh, towards the beginning. We talk about how pyrethrums can reduce those mite infestations. All right, so that's going to be our answer there. And we do suggest we uh, test that in a trial as well. D, humans are more susceptible to varomites. We don't really touch on humans in this section, so D is definitely incorrect as well. So now we're asked for evidence. So that's, like I said, going to be more towards uh, the beginning where we talk about how uh, they need to be at least uh, have intermittent, intermittent feeding on these pyrethrium producing plants um, because bee colonies are more susceptible to mite infestations if they're not feeding on those plants uh, and those can become fatal directly or indirectly through uh, immunocompr immunocompromisation or nutritionally deficient bees, right? So that's lines 24 to 28 where we're really, really talking about how that intermittent feeding on pyrethrium producing plants can help prevent those mite infestations or help combat them. So that's going to be lines 24 to 28 if we have that as an answer choice, and we see that we do. So that's going to be answer choice D for 44. All right, so let's move on to question 45. So we've got 45 is asking us, the passage most strongly suggests that beekeepers' attempts to fight mite infestations with commercially produced insecticides may have what unintentional effect? Well, that's going to be further harming the health of some bees. So how did I know that? Well, I remember if I go back up to uh, where I talked about right here, 31, line 31. In addition, immunocompromised or nutritionally deficient bees may be further weakened when commercially produced insecticides are introduced into their hives by beekeepers in an effort to fight mite infestation. Okay, so we see that uh, some bees are gonna be further weakened and more likely to die as a result of these insecticides. Okay, so that's 31 to 35, uh, and that's showing that it's gonna further harm the health of some bees. Any nutritionally deficient or immunocompromised bees uh, they're going to be further harmed by the use of those insecticides. So that's what we know our answer there is going to be. As far as evidence, uh, like I just said, I believe it was lines 31 through 35. I see it was. That's going to be my evidence there. So that'll be answer choice C. I'll go ahead and cover why um, for 45, A, B, and C are wrong as well. Uh, them saying that insecticides increase certain mite populations, uh, they don't. They actually decrease mite populations. They just kill bees as well, which is why we don't want to use them. Uh, B, they kill some beneficial forms of bacteria. We never make that claim. C, they destroy the bees', bees primary food source. We never make that claim either. All right, now we got 47. As used in line 35, postulate most nearly means. Well, we're going to go through, uh, go to line 35 and come up with our own answer choice first for what postulate would mean. All right, so we've got, we further postulate that the proper dosage necessary to prevent mite infestation may be better left to bees. Okay, so that's really them hypothesizing or speculating. Uh, or putting forth an idea or claim, right? They're claiming something, speculating it, hypothesizing it. Those would all be good answer choices there. So let's see if we have any of those. We have make an unfounded assumption. No, because it is founded. Uh, B, put forth an idea or claim. Yes, that's a great answer choice, and that is the correct answer choice. Uh, C, questioning a belief. No. Uh, and D, concluding based on firm evidence. They don't have that evidence yet, uh, and they can't also conclude it. Postulating means we haven't concluded yet. We're more hypothesizing. So we're not at the conclusion stage yet for that. So that's why D is wrong and B is correct. 48, the main purpose of the fourth paragraph, lines 42 to 50, is to what? Let's go take a look. 42 to 50, uh, we see we're really describing uh, what our experiment's going to be. So we're giving the experimental design. We have talk about our control being clover. We talk about how our, um, uh, our non-control is going to be our pyrethrium producing plants and them eating that. We talk about the bees making a choice and measuring the effect of that. So really our experimental design is what that's going to be talking about. Uh, so that right there is 48. And we see that 48, the only one that talks about proposing an experiment is answer choice B, proposing an experiment to investigate how different diets, uh, clover versus pyrethrium, uh, affect commercial bee colonies susceptible to mite infestations. Right there, B is going to be our correct answer for the main purpose of that fourth paragraph. All right, question 49, an unstated assumption made by the authors about clover plants is what? Well, that's going to be A, that they don't produce pyrethrium. So how did I know that so fast? Well, we know that we're using clovers as a control. So I'll go ahead and show you up here. We talk about how we are going to have them uh, be offered a number of pyrethrium producing plants. And then we talk about how we want to give them a control, which is a typical bee, bee food source. Well, if we're going to do a control to compare those with pyrethrium, that control cannot contain pyrethrium. So those clover plants cannot have pyrethrium in them. So they, A, do not produce pyrethriums. All right, 50. Based on the data in the table and what percent of colonies with colony collapse disorder 
Okay, based on the data in the table and what percent counties with colony collapse disorder were the honeybees infected by all four pathogens. Okay, so we're going to go to our table, find the one uh, with colonies with colony collapse disorder and find what percent have all four pathogens. We see that's right here, so that'll be 77%. So I go down here, find 77%. I see that's going to be answer choice B for 50. So 50 will be B. All right, moving on, we got question 51. Based on the data in the table, which of the four pathogens infected the highest percent of honeybee colonies without colony collapse disorder? Okay, so we're going to go to our column that says colonies without colony collapse disorder. That's our right column here. And we were asked for the one that infects the most or the highest percentage. That's 81. Uh, that's Nosema serenae. So Nosema serenae will be my answer there. So that's answer choice D. So D for 51. Now we got 52. Does the data in the, in the table provide support for the author's claim that infection with varroa mites increases a honeybee's susceptibility to the secondary infections? Our table never says if they have varroa mites or do not, so we cannot make any claim on that. So we can get rid of A and B because they say yes. C, we have uh, C, no, because the data does not provide evidence about bacteria as a cause. Uh, no, we can't make a claim because the data doesn't indicate whether or not the honeybees have been infected with mites. They could be infected, they could not be. We don't know, the data doesn't tell us, therefore we can't make a claim about that. So D is our answer there. So as always, thanks for watching. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, and share. We have a 90-day SAT prep course available. Uh, if you click on our channel, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, it'll also probably pop up on your screen in probably the next 15 seconds. Any private SAT tutoring I'm doing will be linked in the description. Any private college admissions consulting I'm doing will be linked in the description. I'm a 1590 SAT score. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and have a good day.